Hello and good afternoon and welcome back to the Rice and Ally studios. And we will be discussing now for the next 15 minutes uh, one of the biggest stories I think of the past year. And that is the protests that have overtaken one of the world's great cities which is Hong Kong. And with me I have here two uh, academics who are both visitors in some sense to Hong Kong. Uh, professors Herbert Dita and Der Susu. And um, I am going to be asking them um, and we are going to be talking about what uh, the protests in Hong Kong mean uh, for the future of the city and what the rest of the world should be thinking about them. Um, Professor Susu, I will start with you. Um, were in some sense, Hong Kong has seen protests before. They have seen pro-democracy protests before. I think a lot of us around the world are asking, why is this time different? Why do they seem to be going on longer? What is this? Why do they seem to be an edge of anger and maybe even of desperation this time that there wasn't maybe five years ago? Okay, it was a, a coincidence that um, I started a new job in Hong Kong in August mm -hmm. last year, and uh, it was at the height of this anti-government protests, um, and of course. You started this conversation by saying this was one of the biggest stories of the year. And as somebody who teaches communication and media, especially global communication and media, I was intrigued by the fact why was this the global story about protests? Because around that time, and actually leading up to um, the end of the year, there have been many other much more serious and violent. Uh, protests, anti-government protests, including in this country. Somehow they did not get the kind of status of a global story as Hong Kong did. So somebody who studies this was a very, uh, you know sometimes material is given to you to study as an academic and that is what happened to me. Um, and of course there have been anti-government demonstrations. Mm -hmm. How far their democracy led? I'm a bit skeptical about that. But they were anti-government demonstrations. Uh, the most famous one was the umbrella movement. Um, this one was a slightly different scale because it was about, um, you know, it would have, if the, the law that was being, the bill that was, sorry, the bill that was <coughs> being introduced, if that had become law, that would have fundamentally changed the way people live in Hong Kong. Professor Dieter, do you think that it is uh, in any way puzzling to, uh, was it puzzling to you that it sort of took fire in this manner? Um, it was not puzzling. I think it is um, uh, a situation which can be explained and the, the um, reason for me, the main reason why the protests continue well uh, after six months is um, that people are afraid uh, that China will take over and the, the threat of uh, living in an authoritarian um, country is the threat that is the main driver of the protest that continues to unite bankers, violent protesters, accountants, housewives um, and this is a, a truly remarkable change. I think uh, when you compare the current protests with protests in Hong Kong say in 2003 or even if you go back to 1967 under British colonial rule there were also protests but they did not enjoy nearly as widely as wide a support as the uh, current one. So I do not think it is puzzling. Uh, you can see that uh, the tightening of um, regulations, the tightening of uh, the um, supervision that citizens are exposed to in mainland China is a threat to those young people and uh, the older generation supports them. So it is explainable and that the rest of the world watches that is also explainable because um, in the last two or three years, um, many countries um, have altered their perception um, of China. They have become significantly more cautious and in that sense, Hong Kong is the laboratory where the rest of the world uh, observes very closely how mainland China is going to react to those lasting protests. So I have a, just a quick follow-up for you, if I may, Professor. You, you mentioned there the generational question here and I think that uh, uh, one of the things that I'd like, you know, to understand better is, in a lot of parts, in many parts of the world, the protests are led by younger people. Street protests are younger people, and the impression that one got earlier on in the protests uh, in Hong Kong was that there was a generational divide. Parents didn't want their childrens doing this. 
uh, you know, their ch parents did not want their kids out on the street uh, protesting. I, I, that seems to have, uh, that narrative seems to have changed over the months. Is that true? Well, parents all over the world want the best for their Including children. Including in India. And, yes. and they don't want their <laughs> children to be exposed to tear gas and water cannons. That is quite understandable. So, in that sense, there has been caution by the older generation. But at the very same time, we have to consider that uh, in June, there was a demonstration uh, of 25% of the population of Hong Kong. And that was not just young people. Yes. These, were, these were established people. These were... Um, as I said, um, uh, uh, people with a professional background, and uh, this is something we have to take into consideration. And more striking, I was in Hong Kong on the, on the day of the local elections, on 24 November, and this, these were elections that are normally totally boring. I mean, they are on garbage collection and bus <laughs> routes and stuff like that. But on that very day, this was a, a, a referendum on the question whether there is significant support in the population of Hong Kong uh, for the protest movement, and um, as we have seen, there was a, a significant majority in favor of the d uh, democracy camp. That doesn't mean that they are the only voice in town. There are significant parts of the population that would rather have a, a more cooperative relationship with uh, mainland China, but I think the relationship, uh, the, the, the relation may be something like 60-40 in, uh, in that neighborhood. Professor uh, Susu, you, you, um, you, as you said, you're, you're a communications and media person, uh, um, a student of, of, of those fields. And I think that it's quite clear that in the Hong Kong street protests, um, the protesters have been much more adept at managing their messaging, putting their ideas out, than the government. And that is the case in many of these protests, not all uh, across the world, but in India as well, and in many other parts of the world. The protesters, because they're young, they're online, they manage this better. They know what's cool, they know what works. Um, governments are always going to be behind in this, right? Um, in some ways, the protests in Hong Kong, 2019 protests, will become a kind of template, template for how to protest. And I, I know in Indonesia, uh, Jakarta, yeah. people were sending for lessons. And in, yeah. in other parts mm. of the world as yeah. well. Um, so they were phenomenally good mm. at using social media, geolocations, you know, just mm. not just media, but communication strategy was outstanding. Um, but there was also a parallel narrative coming out of Beijing, you know, a mm. much more powerful country with mm. huge media outlets, um, both the official mouthpieces of the Chinese Communist Party were taking a line which was mm. drastically different from what was happening on the ground in, um, in Hong Kong, but also the Chinese social media was extremely active mm. and uh, was doing its bit to demonize the, the um, protesters. And I agree with my uh, uh, fellow panelists that there was a, and is a widespread support for the movement because as I said, the law, if, the, the bill which yeah. if had become law, they would have changed fundamentally the nature of the of Hong Kong life. So, but that bill was taken exactly. away months ago. Why is it continuing? So, I, in 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 your estimation, um, the Ch as you mentioned, China has its powerful media outlets. It has uh, a, 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 you know Beijing has a large number of very sympathetic social media uh, users and uh, as well. Um, is, was their effort on the narrative to control the narrative within the mainland, or did they want to turn the narrative globally also against the protesters? Both. Both. And also within Hong Kong, mm. the people who are writing stuff or mm. putting stuff out on the social media uh, in, in very overtly pro Beijing ways. But I think a more interesting question is, as I was saying at the very beginning, why does it become an international story? Mm. Um, I mean, there are as I was saying earlier, you know, I, I'm actually writing something on geopolitics and communication because my, my background mm. is in IR. I have a PhD in IR from a university in South Delhi, which gets a very bad name in we this country. We won't mention it. We won't <laughs> mention it. Uh, but we all but know. It's, but it's a great place. I can <laughs> say that in, uh, in public. Um, intellectually first rate, anyway. Um, so, you know, 
I am writing this book, Hong Kong was not in my list of things to do. Now I am writing a section, maybe even a chapter, mm. uh, about how it became, uh, in my view, the first case study of a new Cold War yeah. between China and the United States. Mm. And that bigger it's geopolitical I mean, game. If I was to say that, I would say, if you look at the stories around Berlin at the time of the airlift, as this last outpost of democracy, surrounded by a vastly much more powerful authoritarian uh, power. Yeah. And I think there is very much a, a similarity in how people are talking about Hong Kong as they are talking about Berlin. Would you, is that, is that? Well, I lived in Berlin in the 1980s and that mm. was uh, uh, right where blocks met and mm. um, that, uh, that w there was a uh, confrontation between the East and the West. Um, the, the, I think it is, it is um, very important that we keep that in mind. This is a, this is, Hong Kong is, I wouldn't call it the new Berlin, but it is, it is a, a city where uh, the conflict between an authoritarian um, China and a, a, a democratic um, rest of the world, or not entirely the rest of the world, where these meet. But I would like to briefly address the question, why do the protests continue? And I think it is important to uh, point out that th these, these, um, that fight for freedom is not the only motivation. Hong Kongers um, are not poor. They have a per capita GDP of 50,000 US dollars uh, per year. But some of them, quite a few of them, live in rather humble conditions. Uh, apartments are small and outrageously expensive. Um, inequality is extremely high. Uh, very affluent people um, don't pay taxes at all on the dividends that they that they make. So, so these social um, undercurrents, at least I think, um, help to understand why protests continue, despite the fact that the main goal of the protesters, the um, achieved, yeah. the uh, withdrawal of the extradition law, has already been achieved. Yeah. But you know, I think it's it's a common theme in street protests across the world that it's very hard to disentangle questions of e uh, economy, fear for the future, and, and maybe even a growing sense of identity. And you know, these are uh, difficult to uh, disentangle. But what I will ask is, I think, to close off this discussion is, do you feel that in the course of these protests, uh, uh, an additional Hong Kong notion of itself is developing? Is there a, is there a city identity that is emerging? that is uh, uh, um, you know, part of what dr is driving these for longer? Um, can I, I think you first and then yeah. uh, Professor. Um, one of the great advantages of being in a university is you're always interacting with young people. Yeah. And um, most Hong Kongers today are far more politicized than they were yeah. before the protest. And there's a much greater sense of identity and also um, this idea that uh, my, my fellow panelists mentioned that there, is, there are social problems, economic problems, and some of these are related to the big brother next door. Mm -hmm. They're coming, buying up land, buying up Both. flats. Mm -hmm. Things have become extremely expensive mm -hmm. for ordinary uh, citizens. So there is a, a kind of politicization in a very serious way. And I think that's going to outlast this moment. There is um, a the creation of a, a deeper identity, but that is not restricted to Hong Kong. Uh, uh, one uh, observer had suggested that previously we had one country, two systems. Now we have one country, two nationalisms, uh, because there has also been a, a sharpening of the, of the national identity of mainland Chinese. And uh, this is, um, continues to shape the conflict. And there I, are linguistic conflicts yeah, as well. Uh, mm, there course. is. The languages are different. Uh, um, and uh, so I think, yes, uh, the conflict has contributed to um, a, a sharpening of the or deepening of the identity of, uh, of Hong Kongers and mainlanders. And um, at the university where I work, of course, you see all sorts of Lenin walls and some of the Lenin walls in the latest weeks have additional content, uh, the additional content being that uh, um, the, a call for more n autonomy, I call it autonomy, probably not sovereignty, but autonomy uh, can be seen. Wonderful. So um, thank you so much for joining us, both of you. And um, this will continue to be something that we're all fascinated by. And I hope you enjoy the discussion. Oh.